Pastor Hawkins, do you need a pulpit? You're going to stand right here and I'm gonna preach from the air? A little stand right here. You got a little stand right there? I do. I can get a big stand for you, a big wooden one right over there. Oh, I'm a, it's got a cross on it. I'm a, I'm a small guy with a short sermon, so okay. I just need this. <laughs> can we, can we uh, give a hand for a short sermon tonight, <laughs> Pastor Hawkins? We love you. <laughs> Thank you. Pastor Jeff said uh, we love Iowa. I, I love Iowa. I absolutely, I, I don't know why, but I do. I, it, it's not their basketball teams, but I, I love Iowa. I love, I love Des Moines. I love Clive. I love my neighborhood. I love my house. I love my den in my house. I'm kind of easy to please. I'm happy to be in Iowa, and I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy that you're here tonight. And I really thought this morning was, was wonderful, the ministry fair. Really enjoyed that. Uh, Pastor Brian did a good job this morning reminded, m reminding all of us that we have this opportunity in life to be of service to the Lord and to one another. And when we serve one another, we serve the Lord. We serve one another in His name. And you know, our service doesn't have to be high visibility, doesn't have to be earth-shaking. It can be something really quite routine. Jesus talked about offering a cup of cold water in my name. He said that will not happen without getting its reward. What could be more basic, <laughs> more simple than just offering someone a cup of water? So I want to thank you not only for your, your willingness to serve, but really um, your desire your desire to put your life to good service, to serve the Lord and to serve others in His name. And that's kind of what we want to talk about tonight. We want to talk about a man who did that. He, he held nothing back. He laid it all on the line in his enthusiastic and relentless service for the Lord. His testimony is found in 2 Timothy. If you'll join me, please, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. We want to look at these very few verses, but oh my, the information that is compiled in this brief passage of Scripture. The Apostle Paul said, For I, in verse 6, chapter 4, 2 Timothy, by the way, his last letter, and so these are some of his very last words. He's writing to the young preacher, Timothy, it's time to pass the baton on to the next generation. You've got old and young here. And uh, so Paul is writing to him, and he's reflecting on his life. He's doing that because he knows that his life is very quickly coming to an end. And he says, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is near. Go to the next verse because your version is a little different than mine and I'll stay with yours. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing, and I'd love to spend more time in that verse, verse 8, but we're just not going to have, if I do that, it won't be a short sermon at all, but there's uh, such a meaning in each and every one of these verses. Some of you might recall, and I hope you do, that two Sunday nights ago, we looked at 1 Timothy, at Paul's admonition to the young preacher to fight the good fight. And now we look at 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy was written just a couple of years after 1 Timothy, and it was Paul's last letter because Paul is in prison, and he's facing certain execution for preaching the gospel. As Paul looks back on his life, he's able to write with all honesty and accuracy, I have fought the good fight. Aren't you glad 
that Paul practiced what he preached. Aren't you glad that he conducted himself in the way that he challenged others to live? Aren't you glad that he was the real deal? That he was not only able to say to Timothy, fight the good fight, but he was able to say, I have fought the good fight. In this last chapter of this last letter, one of my favorite realms of study in Scripture, Paul presents three great truths about himself. And if you have any interest in the biographies of men of faith and courage, you will surely find every word informative and inspirational. First of all, let's look at Paul's life. He presents us with the record of his life here. What does he say about his life? How does he summarize it? You might ask, what are these final words that would serve as his epitaph? What would the inscription on his tombstone say? And by the way, those can be very interesting and very telling. There's one that reads, Here lies an atheist, all dressed up and no place to go. <laughs> Another reads, I made some good deals and I, I made some bad ones. I really went in the hole with this one. Another says, here lies the body of Jonathan Blake, stepped on the gas instead of the brake. <laughs> and another simply says, I knew this would happen. <laughs> and another, here lies John Yeast, pardon me for not rising. <laughs> and my favorite still is, I told you I was sick. <laughs> then there's this one beneath the daisies and beneath the trees lies the bones of old man peas but peas is not here only the pod peas shelled out and went to god <laughs> some people have a sense of humor they take it to the grave with them some people have a sense of humor and some don't here's what paul said i have fought the good fight I fought for the truth. I have fought against any man or devil that opposed the truth. Sometimes I fought alone. Back in verse 10, he says, Demas deserted me. Crescens and Titus are gone. In verse 16, everyone deserted me. Sometimes I fought alone, but I didn't stop fighting. Sometimes I fought against wicked man. men. In verse 14, Alexander the metal worker did me a great deal of harm. He strongly opposed our message. But I fought the good fight. Sometimes I fought lions. But in verse 17, I was delivered from every evil attack. The Lord stood by my side and gave me strength. I fought the good fight when it was not easy or convenient or popular. I fought the good fight. And then he says, I have finished the race. Paul often likened the Christian life to an athletic endeavor. I, I find that so appealing. I've always been athletically oriented and very involved in athletics. And, and even as a young man, this stirred my heart. It aroused something in me when I heard Paul talk about the Christian life as a race or a fight or wrestling or boxing. The Christian life, not for sissies. To fight the good fight of faith takes everything an athlete needs. Training, discipline, sacrifice, focus, determination, persistence, and will. In the Christian life, not a hundred-yard dash. It's a marathon, and it takes patience and persistence, and after that, more patience and persistence, and after that, even more. Think of the obstacles fall, Paul faced running his race. Hostility at every turn, prison, stocks, stones, and shipwreck, hunger, thirst, nakedness, public humiliation, and rejection that would have destroyed most any man. 
But I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And then he said, I've kept the faith. Now that's saying something. Because whatever your theology is, you have to admit that bad things can happen to people's faith. Some, Paul says, in 1 Timothy 1.19, you can hold on to faith and a good conscience, but he says, some have rejected these and shipwrecked their faith. In chapter 4 and verse 1, some will abandon the faith. Chapter 5, verse 8, he says, you can deny the faith. Chapter 6, verse 10 and verse 21, some have wandered from the faith. But Paul said, I have kept the faith. When they said, deny Christ, I declared him. When they said, renounce your faith, I reiterated the lordship of Christ and my love for him and my undying loyalty to him. When they said, recant or die, I said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and to die is gain. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. This is Paul's life the record of it, and secondly, Paul brings into focus Paul's death and the reality of it, and the reality is Paul's death is imminent, and he knows it. Here's the way he says it. The time of my departure is at hand. So easy to just float on the top of those words and not See the message being conveyed. You see, when it came to his death, he didn't talk about death. He deliberately opted for a more informed word, a much fuller word, a faith-inspired word. He used the word departure, and that word departure is a loaded word. And using that word Paul is telling us a lot about his death and our death, the death of every believer. For one thing, it was a traveler's word. We're all on a journey, aren't we? It's a traveler's word. It meant to take down a tent and move on. And what did Paul do for a living, his secular work? He was a tent maker. And if Paul was any kind of man, he was a traveling man. He's known for his three missionary journeys, all three of them filled with hardships and heartaches and miracles. But now the journey's over, and now he's at the end of it, and it's time to fold up the tent and to lay it aside and to move on. The Bible does liken our physical link to this world to that of a tent because a tent is fragile and it's temporary. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not made, not built by human hands. So death is not the end of the journey. Death is not the end of the adventure for the believer. In fact, it only gets better. It was a traveler's word, but it was also a sailor's word, and it meant to to hoist anchor and set sail. Paul was quite familiar with such terminology. He was a seasoned seafarer. It's been calculated. There'll be a test on this, so remember this answer. It's been calculated that Paul traveled at least 3,500 miles by sea. And in the catalog of his sufferings, he specifically mentions three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day in the open sea, being in danger from rivers and in danger at sea. 
But now the weary old sailor is ready for the final voyage. He's ready to hoist anchor and set sail into the harbor of peace where there will be no more storms, no more danger, no more threats. Death will be a release and a departure, a lifting of the anchor and setting sail for that peaceful shore. A sailor's word it was. But it was also, and I'm happy to tell you this, Iowa, it was also a farmer's word. It was often used of unyoking the animal, the ox, at the end of the hard day's work. I'll tell you, farmers are hard workers. If they're not, they don't stay in business. I heard a story decades ago that I still remember, the story of the Iowa and the Texas farmer who met one another at a, at a convention. And the Iowa farmer struck up a conversation with the Texan, and he said, well, tell me, sir, he said, how big, how big is your spread there in Texas? And the Texan said, well, sir, he said, it's like this. I get up in the morning when the sun is just coming up, and I get in my truck, and I drive west, and I just drive all day long. And by the time I get to the point where the sun is setting, that's about where the end of my spread is. And the Iowa farmer looked at him and said, yeah, I used to have a truck like that. <laughs> you got a truck like that, you better be a hard worker. The farmer competes against pests and pestilences. In chapter 2, Paul references the hard-working farmer. He puts him in the same category as the good soldier or the competing athlete. And Paul had worked hard. Oh, he had worked hard. He had gone and tilled the soil where it had never been tilled so the gospel seed could be planted. He had faithfully, tirelessly served, and now it was time for him to hear, well done. Good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. Also, Equally or perhaps even of greater enlightenment is the fact that this word departure was a prisoner's word, and it meant to be released from prison. Funny thing, Paul was in prison. In chapter 1, verse 8, he tells Timothy, do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner. In chapter 2, verse 8, he says, This is my gospel for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. Oh, he'd been in prison before, but this time it was different and he knew it. This would be the last time, and he knew it. But he also knew it was time for a prison break. He also knew it was... De death was going to be his getting out of prison day. That death was going to be a release from Nero's prison. There's no way Nero can win. He cannot win by killing Paul because killing Paul was not killing Paul. It was only releasing him from prison and sending him home. So we have... Paul's life, we have Paul's death, but then thirdly, we have Paul's life after death. You ever wonder what that will look like? Oh, I wonder about it every day of my life. I wondered about it even as a kid before I met the Lord. I wondered about it. I found somebody who could give me answers. No better source than Paul himself. Look what he says in verse 8. There's this, in store for me the crown of righteousness, he says, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. You see, the word depart means to leave one place and go to another. 
when you're in the airport, the beginning of the trip is called departure. And the end of the trip is called arrival. Departure has an arrival on the end of it. So Paul is not just departing planet earth. He's going to arrive in heaven. He's going to arrive in the presence of the Lord. He's going to his reward. Now listen, since I've been here, it's been about five years now, I have probably studied Paul more than I ever have in my life. And I have this intense passion to follow this man's footsteps and to hear his words and to learn more and more about him. There are times when I feel like I can almost feel the heartbeat of Paul. And I just got one question for him. Just one question I need to ask Paul. And the answer to that, well, it answers everything else. The question is, Paul, was it worth it? Paul, I, re I read about the persecution and abuse that you suffered in Antioch and how they ran you out, you and Barnabas out of town. And it was, it was a brutal experience. It had to be emotionally traumatic. Paul, I got to ask you, was it worth it? I read how you fled to Iconium from there, and there was a plot there to beat you and to stone you to death. Lord, I hate it when that happens. But then you fled for your life to Lystra and Derby, and when you got there, you preached and you healed a lame man, and the, and the crowd showed their appreciation by stoning you and dragging you outside the city. And they left you for what they thought was dead. And somehow you weren't dead. And the next day, you're preaching again. Paul, I, I've never been stoned. I've had, I've had hurts. I've had disappointments. I've heard words, read words. I've seen expressions on people's faces that showed disappointment, disapproval. And even that set me back. But Paul, let me ask you, was it worth it? And then I know you had a vision. And in that vision came a call to Macedonia. And you went to Philippi where, where good things happened. A businesswoman was converted, and, and a slave girl was delivered. But then, it's, as always, bad things happen, too. You and Silas were stripped, viciously beaten, fastened in stocks, and thrown into prison. Was it worth it? And on you went to Thessalonica where you faced life-threatening mobs and riots. And they came looking for you, Paul. And if, and if they would have found you, they would have killed you and celebrated your death. Was it worth it? It just never gets any better. Another riot in Ephesus because the fortune tellers and the idol makers were afraid you were going to put them out of business. And there you are again facing more plots and more prison. My God, man, tell me, was it worth it? How could it be? That's all I want to know. Perhaps you wonder the same. But wait a minute. Haven't you read Paul's declaration? I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now there's in store for me the crown of righteousness. What? The crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. He says, now, right here, right now, this time, this place, in this prison, after fighting the good fight, right under Nero's nose. There is in store for me, in store laid up, reserved, with my name on it, 
where our Savior said moth and rust cannot destroy and where thieves cannot break in and steal. Like my friend Peter said, an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven. There is in store for me the crowd of righteousness. And was it worth it? Oh, I hear Paul saying, what are stones thrown compared to stones worn as jewels in this crown? What's a dirty dungeon compared to streets of gold and walls of jasper and foundations of precious stones and gates of pearl? What are the slurs of men compared to the well done of our Savior? What is time compared to eternity, earth compared to heaven, man compared to God, earthly kings compared to the King of kings? Was it worth it? I hear, I hear him saying, let me put it this way. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. This is why I have fought the good fight. This is why I have admonished you to fight the good fight. Aren't you glad you're one of them? A follower of Christ. What appropriate epitaph would accompany your demise? I hope it doesn't say something like, woulda, coulda, shoulda. I hope it doesn't say, self-centered from beginning to end. I hope it doesn't say, had so much to give, yet kept it all to himself. I hope it will be in keeping with what Paul's would have said. I fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. I finish the course. Would you stand with me as we look to the Lord together? Father God, you know, we used to sing a song, uh, it will be worth it all. That's what I'm trying to say. It will be worth it all. And when we come to the end of this life, I hope that we're able to, if God would allow it, to have a few reflective moments that we could look back on our lives and say something that would echo what Paul has said. I hope we can look back on a life of loving service, a life of joyful service to the Lord and loving service to one another. In these moments as we sing together, these moments of really personal reflection in the light of the ultimate reality that life has an end to it down here. But it has a departure at the end of it. I hope that we can just take this moment and be in the Lord's presence and say, Lord, show me, show me what I need to know from you. Grant to me your guidance and direction and your inspiration to do all that you want me to do, uh, not in order to gain anything, but just in order, Lord, to have made this life, this one-time life you've given me, the most it can be for your glory. Let's stand in his presence and invite his, his spirit to speak to our hearts tonight.